family mode. All right, hello everyone and welcome to the October Quality in Action webinar. Uh, this is April Reardon speaking. You'll see a little photo of me in a moment, but uh, we're glad to have you here today. We've got lots of uh, registrations. I think we're about halfway there um, with getting people onto the webinar but want to get started on time. So we are, it's a popular topic this month about parent and caregiver involvement in youth mentoring programs. Uh, just to go over some of these logistics, again, that's me, uh, Director of Training and Community Partnerships with the Mentoring Partnership of Minnesota. Uh, we've been offering the Quality in Action series all year um, and really looking at how can we bring some uh, information, uh, uh, tying research uh, and quality practices and highlighting um, things for practitioners on, on how to bring quality to action in our programs. Uh, excited about the topic today and uh, I know Andrea Taylor, we'll introduce her in a second, but she is really interested in getting some feedback from all of our attendees today and she'll share a little bit more uh, about why, but I wanted to share how to give that feedback. So um, we do have the ability to raise your hand. There should be a little hand icon that you can click on uh, and try to find that. And when you do that, then uh, when I will, I can unmute you. And if you have, if you're on the phone or if you have a microphone, then you can actually just share your question or comment with us when you're unmuted. We do keep everyone muted during the presentation, just so we can control the background noise and, and make sure we get a, a good quality recording. Uh, and we also have more participants than. Uh, than we have space for. If we had less than 25, we could uh, unmute everyone and try to deal with that, but we keep everyone unmuted. So we'd strongly encourage you to raise your hand. We'd love to hear your voices during the webinar. However, I do know that some of you, you might not be comfortable doing that, or you might have a lot of background noise, um, or you might not have access to a microphone and you might just be listening. So you can also find the question tab and you can type your questions and comments into that question section. And then um, if it's a specific question that we can respond directly to you with, um, we'll do so. Or, um, you know, for any of those comments and questions that, that have to do with some things that Andrea is seeking feedback for, we can go ahead and read those so that they get shared with all of the attendees. Uh, and just, you know, like I said, if you are unmuted and choose to speak during the webinar, which would be, again, greatly encouraged, uh, just please monitor your background noise. Uh, if we hear something else, though, too, if somebody uh, is unmuted or we forget to mute you, we have the ability to take care of that as well. So um, those are some of those logistics. Feel free to submit any questions as well. And to welcome our today's panelist, or really presenter, uh, usually we uh, come up with a topic for our Quality in Action webinars and then Mentoring Partnership of Minnesota, our staff puts together um, some slides and the topic and we invite someone to just participate. But Andrea Taylor goes above and beyond and, and really put together the slides and, and created this presentation and it's just so incredibly generous considering how busy she is. Uh, we are excited to have her coming this month for the Minnesota Mentoring Conference as our keynote presenter and she'll also be delivering two workshops that day. So busy, busy, busy. Uh, and she can tell you a, a little bit more, I'm sure, about her background with this topic about parental and caregiver involvement in mentoring programs. But uh, we had Andrea here last month. Excited to have her with us again this month. But um, uh, so Dr. Taylor, she's the Director of Training at Temple University's um, Intergenerational Center, and we are excited uh, to have you with us. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Okay. I have to. I had to share with everyone how you've gone above and beyond the call of duty <laughs> as our <laughs> our webinar panelist and uh, keynote speaker and everything. So, um, so well, I'm going to just proceed forward. Or if you want to give a, a, okay. a little more background here, this would be a great spot. A little bit of background, if I could, and then I'll kind of show sure. you. Hi, everybody. Um, wonderful to be here with you this afternoon, and. Um, 
this is a really interesting topic for me. I, this is the first webinar I've ever done on parent involvement in youth mentoring programs. Um, but I came to this in a couple of ways. One is that as the developer and director of the Across Ages program, which is an intergenerational mentoring uh, program for middle school students, um, and probably some of you are familiar with it, and all of the mentors are people in that 50 plus category. Um, but we had a, a family component to the program which really involved a monthly weekend activities for the parents and caregivers. Uh, it was an opportunity to bring siblings and, you know, really to get the whole family engaged in the, in the mentoring process. And we didn't um, assess that component through our sort of standard survey process. What we did was we interviewed parents and we interviewed mentors and um, you know, kind of got a sense from the, the families about the impact of this, uh, the program on them and, and the family involvement activities. And what we found, not surprisingly, was that the families who participated on a regular basis, um, for them, for their children, that the mentoring relationship also seemed to be kind of stronger and more sustained, so that there was some real communication between the parents and the mentors and the kids felt like their parents were really supporting this whole effort. Um, that was the upside. The downside was that sometimes the, the um, parents would kind of blur the boundaries a bit, and so the kids sort of felt like their, you know, their mentor, their special friend had suddenly gone over to the other side and was you know, kind of too friendly with the mentor. So, um, however, I will say that all in all, we felt that the family involvement was a very, very strong component to the program. So that's how I got involved from the practice side. From the research side, I just completed uh, the writing of a chapter for the second edition of the Handbook of Youth Mentoring, uh, which is edited by David Dubois and Michael Karsher, both of whom you may be familiar with because they have done a prolific amount of research in the youth mentoring field. And they edited the first edition of the handbook, which came out about five years ago. They've also both done webinars for us and have been keynote presenters yeah, for the yeah. Minnesota Mentoring <laughs> Conference. Many people you know, who are on yeah. this call have probably uh, seen them, heard them, read them, et cetera. Um, so at any rate, they invited me to write this chapter on uh, family involvement and youth mentoring. And it was very challenging. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what some of those challenges uh, were. Um, and one of the things I'm hoping is that we can have something of a conversation during the course of the webinar, because I'd really like to hear from all of you about what your experiences have been and you know, how does what you do kind of fit into the, to the research. And I know that I'm going to have an opportunity to um, edit the chapter, because once David and Michael get finished with it, I'm sure I'll have a lot, of, a lot more work to do. But I'm, you know, I'm thinking that perhaps there might be something that would emerge from our conversation this afternoon that I could use to kind of support and, and supplement uh, what's in there now. So I hope you'll feel free and comfortable to uh, contribute to the conversation. That's a lot of background. So, <laughs> so let's move forward. Here we go. OK. You're going to advance for me, right? Okay. I am, yes. OK. So these are our goals for the session this afternoon, is to really understand some of the theory that promotes the importance of uh, family and parent involvement in the mentor-youth relationship. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the tension that exists in the research revol regarding involving families in the relationship. Um, we're going to look a little bit at what research is out there uh, and what it's telling us, talk briefly about practices that engage parents, and hopefully develop some guidelines for the field. Sorry about that. <laughs> that uh, I wondered where that was coming from. Sorry, I knew it wasn't coming my from My office is where right I in the heart of, heart of North Philadelphia, so okay. everything goes on outside my window. So. <laughs> okay, next slide. So just a little bit, what are some of the strategies that you utilize to engage parents and caregivers? in your programs? Do you involve the siblings and extended family members? What kinds of things do you host? What have you seen of some of the benefits? What are some of the challenges? Um, this is kind of a lot of questions. So <laughs> maybe we could start with, yeah, what are, the, what are some of the strategies that you use, and, and what do you see as the, the benefits and challenges? And this is where you can raise your hand 
to mm -hmm. participate or type in those questions and we will read those. So we'll give you a moment um, to do that and I will respond accordingly. Okay, we've got the first one here. Thank you, Ingrid, here, or Rita, here we go. Oh, Ingrid, here we go. We invite, says that we invite waitlist and matched families to seasonal outings in addition to the mentors and mentees. Mm -hmm. And um, siblings and guardians are invited to larger group events about six times a year. There's another program. Thank you, Ingrid and Rita. Other strategies that programs use. Okay. Uh, it's another person who says, we open up our events to siblings and parents and waiting youth as well. So they're doing similar things, but also that they offer to pick up the youth if there's no transportation available. Mm-hmm, great, okay. And, all right, here's another one. Um, twice a year events for family members from Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. Got another one. And Kathy, you are unmuted. Oh, yep, you started typing, okay. Anybody else have a hand raised? Here's another comment. Um, in addition to actual events, um, the, the guardians, parents or guardians, sign off on um, guidelines that they expect them to follow during the match, and in addition to the monthly, in addition to the monthly or quarterly phone connections. So mm -hmm. it sounds like there's a lot of strategies for staying connected okay. with parents Great. and family members. You know what, let's, I think what we'll do is we'll move on and then if you, in the course of the webinar, if you have additional ideas or any comments. Oh, we'll we do have another hand raised too. Come back I can to oh, okay. Get to that. So Kathy, did you want to, I can unmute you? You want to share something, Kathy? Mm. All right. Okay. I think that's that noise is, is, is yeah. from Kathy, so we'll, we'll skip down. Um, here's another question, though. Uh, our, it talks about, it's from Kathy. So our challenges are families, are that families and parents get confused. Sort of what kind of event is this? Um, is it for mentors and mentees? Is it for kids who are waiting? Um, so maybe by offering events, that some of the challenges that come up is that families and parents have a hard time keeping track of Okay. Is this one that I can come to or not? Hopefully I'm, I'm summarizing that appropriately, Kathy. Okay. Great. Okay, good. Thank you very much, everybody. And as I said, if you, you know, you want to keep typing as we go, that, that would be great, too. So, okay, let's move to the next slide. I'll just add to, if I haven't read your comment, um, for the sake of, of Andrea and, and making edits and revisions, we do keep track of the the, serve, the webinar service records your comments so that we can share those and pass those along mm -hmm. to Andrea. We do have one more, if you want me just to, to share that oh, one, um, just about the benefits of parental involvement and saying that um, it keeps the communication lines open between the mentor and the parent, between the parent and the program, etc. cetera. Um, also that parents also are important for scheduling match activities and that inconsistency in communication can be a challenge for mentors. Great. Excellent. Thank you all. Okay, and it's also hopefully possible, with April, that even after the webinar is over, if people have comments, that they can maybe they can shoot those to you also. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next slide. All right. Okay. So essentially, when we look at theory around the importance of parent involvement or family involvement or caregiver involvement, I wasn't quite sure how to phrase this. So every time I say parent, you can think you know, caregiver, guardian, whatever comes to mind. 
But we're kind of looking at three things. So one is about family systems therapy, or theory rather, and I'm sure probably many of you are familiar with it, which is essentially that you really can't sort of separate the child from the family system. Um, it's this whole thing about you know, if you're doing family therapy, you really have to kind of talk to everybody and not just think of the child as the, the client. And it's really the same thing here. And a lot of the work has to do with the fact that you know a child can have a mentor, but they're still a part of a family, they're part of a community. So we really need to kind of look at this more holistically. The second theory is around parent acceptance theory. And essentially what that says is that if the child knows that the parent you know, buys into the mentoring relationship and they're supportive, it really helps the child to be more invested. And then the last one is systemic mentoring theory. And uh, I don't know if Tom Keller has, if you've had him around too, but he's also mm -hmm. in the a prolific researcher in the field, and he's talking about the fact that there's a real um, sort of web between the mentor, the parent, the child, and the um, staff person at your agency. So there's really got to be, it's important that there's communication um, amongst all four of the participants, and that when there is, um, that the, the relationships have a better chance of being sustained. Now, I will say that his theory hasn't been tested empirically, so right now it's just a theory. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. I do, this might be a good time to mention, too, that um, Andrea, among other ways of going above and beyond, has a list of references for all of, the, um, all of these things that we can send out to you after the webinar as well. So if you're frantically writing down things or... So if you <laughs> Read more, yeah, we, it's yeah. all referenced. You'll be able to see exactly where I got all this uh, material from. Okay. Next slide. Okay. So um, the research is one of these. On the one hand, it says this, and on the other hand, it says that. Okay. So on the one hand, um, there is some work out there that essentially says that non-supportive parents um, may try and sabotage the mentor-youth relationship by not respecting appropriate boundaries between the mentoring youth, maybe pulling the mentors in, um, you know, sometimes being pretty absent. So that the some of these researchers are essentially saying it's really better to involve the families in a minimal way. So that's the one hand. Okay, next slide. On the other hand, <laughs> oh and so this is this is the conclusion that they've come to rather that it's preferable not to engage them. As mm -hmm. I said, in any you know major way, because you don't want to risk disrupting the relationship between the, the child and the mentor, and that's the um, so the other hand research, however. Is, oh, so I mean to um, keep going. I broke these up into three slides, so. Oh, okay, because I'm trying. Oh, that's right. I had them on one. I'm trying to think. Okay. <laughs> right. Okay. I just wasn't so, keeping yeah. up. So, Sorry. This is, this is when the mentors overstep family boundaries, that sometimes the kids get very disappointed because they feel that their relationship is really, or that the focus of the mentor's attention has shifted away from them. Okay, okay so, so those now. Are, I think that's it. Okay. No, so. Sorry, that was my fault. <laughs> that's okay, no problem. So that now we're on the other hand here. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, is this this meta uh, analysis that David Dubois did, which I think many many people have probably seen over the years, um, is that parental involvement is really found to be one of those program practices that's associated with positive outcomes. And so here are some ideas about what that looks like. So procedures for systematic monitoring of the program implementation, using mentors with backgrounds and helping roles or professions, ongoing. Oh, these are some of the other. Um, uh, things that uh, that came out of that study. Ongoing post-match training for mentors, use of community settings uh, for mentoring, clearly established expectations expectations for frequency of mentor use interaction, and structured activities. So all of those practices taken together with parent involvement produced positive outcomes for uh, mentored youth. Yeah, and for anyone who's participated in that these webinars in the past, we've looked at the same table several times, but oftentimes are looking at different boxes within here. And so this is the first time we've really looked at this parental involvement piece. Mm -hmm. Okay. So 
Understanding what types of parental involvement and under what circumstances helps to facilitate sustained effective relationships. Now, I want to just mention that this study by Renee Spencer um, was just published. Uh, it might even be in press, actually, and she was kind enough to send it to me. And this is a really interesting point, because what we've tended to do when we talk about parent involvement is we actually haven't asked the parents. So we talk about parental involvement from the perspectives of program staff, from the perspectives of mentors, even sometimes from the perspective of the kids, uh, which is how we got some of that data about, you know, when my mentor is too friendly with my family, it makes me feel like I'm being pushed out. Um, what Renee did actually was that she interviewed parents about their um, expectations for the mentoring relationship um, and kind of looked at some of the roles that, that they took on. So we don't know, we know a little bit and we don't know a lot. So let's see what we do know here. Okay. So in my um, extensive <laughs> review of the literature, um, I, I also have to, in the, in just to really confess everything here, is that uh, I was a bit overdue in getting the final chapter in. And one of the challenges that I had was that um, this is not a field in which we've done a tremendous amount of research. So we have different types of programs that involve families, but we've not really kind of pulled out the, the family piece per se. So that's one of the things that made it challenging. So when I looked at this, there were kind of three types of family involvement that seemed to emerge. So one is youth and family mentoring. There's a lot of work that's been done around involving families in school-based initiatives, um, you know, particularly getting parents involved and helping their kids academically and, you know, really supporting the whole family and so forth. Very little about that from the perspective of, the, of, of family mentoring, which is what I really had to focus on. Um, but essentially, the, um, just to talk a little bit more about this particular, the youth and family mentoring, one of the studies that I found was um, done actually with uh, Latino parents in North Dakota. No, I'm sorry, Nebraska, Nebraska. And the, the focus of that particular program was they were really trying to address very high dropout rates um, of these kids, um, high rates of violence in schools. and a lot of kind of family um, disorganization and so forth. So they connected the kids. There was an identified child in the family who did receive one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring. But they also then provided uh, family activities. They provided um, educating parents around parenting skills, communication. They were able to connect the family members to resources in the community. Uh, particularly around helping them with uh, resume writing and getting GEDs and you know educational opportunities that would help them to become employed. And um, some of the, the results of that were they, they really felt that uh, the, the parents indicated particularly that they felt they were much more able to work effectively with their kids, they had better communication, and in general they felt less stressed because they also felt supported. The second um, kind of body of research that I looked at was youth mentoring and family skill building. And this was, these were programs where the uh, kids had, sometimes they had one-to-one -one mentoring, sometimes they had, um, and that would be community-based, sometimes they had mentoring um, in, the, in the school setting. Um, and the families, however, participated in uh, particularly things like um, parenting classes. And these programs, by and large, were targeted at kids who were particularly aggressive and disruptive. Uh, so they were really, the idea was to really kind of reduce some of the, the, the violence that they were seeing and bullying and so forth with the kids in the school setting. Um, and these programs, I've got Early Risers, and Early Risers actually is now a um, uh, a model program that's been identified by the Center for Substance Abuse Prevention um, as a evidence-based prevention project. So if you go on the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration website, you can see, get lots of information about early risers along with kind of implementation issues. Um, 
The other program that, programs that I looked at was something called Prime Time, uh, which was also very comprehensive in terms of mentoring for kids and family skill building activities and uh, also uh, involved staff doing outreach to families in the home. Um, and then the third um, category was probably what's really of most interest to most of us is looking at youth mentoring and family activities. And these are programs that involve families, as many of you have just indicated, in kind of occasional activities. Um, so there's the cross-age mentoring program, otherwise known as CAMP, which is Michael Karcher's uh, program. A program called Girl Power, which actually is kind of an add-on to Big Brothers Big Sisters. And it's a program that's specifically targeting uh, mentors and their female mentees uh, around health-related issues. Um, this study of Big Brothers Big Sisters that uh, was done by Wheeler and Dubois indicated that this wasn't actually, um, they looked at a number of Big Brothers Big Sisters programs and what they determined was that parents who were involved, as some of you indicated, in things like um, um, you know pre-matching activities, kind of education about the program, um, weekend things, that th those, those parents tended to indicate more satisfaction with the relationships. And again, the relationships seem to be sustained longer. And then the Across Ages program, which I talked to you about at the beginning, um, involved families in these monthly weekend activities. So that's kind of a, those are the programs in, in synopsis. So, OK. Great. Um, any questions or comments before we, uh, we move forward? OK. Um, I just actually, you know what, I want to talk a little bit more. Let me just go back and, and, and talk a little bit more specifically about the, the cross-age mentoring program um, involves families in uh, orientation sessions, of course, before the program starts. Um, they do have some involvement in the matching process. And then they also have Saturday activities that involve the families and the mentors and kids. And it's an opportunity. The Saturday activities are time for people to get involved in kind of social activities, but also uh, for the mentors and the um, uh, parents to get to know each other a little bit better. Um, the Girl Power, which I just indicated, was a that was a, a special add-on to Big Brothers Big Sisters, and there were, I believe, three months of um, special workshops that the mentors and mentees participated in. And they, as they said, they had these health-related um, activities. The way that they involved the parents with that was they um, sent regular communications home to the parents after each one of these sessions. And then the parents also received um, kind of notes and tips on how to talk with the kids about the health-related topics that were discussed in the workshops. Um, and then I did, I mentioned a bit about Across Ages in terms of our Saturday workshops. Or I do want to mention that um, one of the things that the mentors did in Across Ages was they often really took an interest in making sure that the families got there. So they would, you know, call them to leading up to the activity to make sure that the family was going to come. They would either help with the transportation by driving them themselves or um, Philadelphia has a not a great public transit system, but at least it has one. And so sometimes they would say, you know, I'll meet you at the subway stop, or you know, I'll meet you at the house and we'll walk together. Um, or when we offered transportation to events, they would often accompany the families on the bus. So there was a lot of um, reaching out to make sure that the um, um, the parents got there. Um, and I think that was really that ended up being very helpful, and that was one of the things that really facilitated those those relationships. Okay, now we can we can move forward now. Okay. Okay. So jump in with your questions or raise your hand at any point. Yeah. Anybody? Anything that I've said so far that people either want to comment on or or maybe have a question about? I'll let you know if they do. I think the okay. getting into the program practices and what's missing is probably going to trigger more 
Okay. Yeah. So, in general, we kind of looked at um, it, four main areas uh, of program practices that really promote parent involvement. So the first one is helping them, you know, the parents really understand what the, the goals of the program are and what the roles of the mentor um, could be. And that really involves things like, um, again, many of these things that you're already doing, it involves uh, inviting the family members to an orientation session. Uh, it involves kind of, you know, keeping them apprised of throughout the, um, of the course of the program, what's going on, really making sure that there is communication there. Um, one of the things that, um, something that we used to do and I've been encouraging when I go out to do training with other sites is helping the, the um, parents understand the roles of the mentor. And so one of the training activities that I do a lot is having people uh, in an orientation section kind of reflect back in their lives. We talk about, you know, we, we give a definition of a mentor, but then we talk about as you look back on your own life, is there anybody that you would consider to be a mentor? You know, and it could have been, it could have been a neighbor, it could have been a, a family member that maybe wasn't in their immediate family, um, it could have been somebody in school that they remember, and we have them sort of think about, so what was it that that person did, and you know, kind of what were the roles that they played? And we really can, we really generate a conversation, and of course, most of the time when you ask, um, we ask the parents, you know, can you think of somebody that you think would have been a mentor? They're like, no, I never had a mentor, because they're thinking of it in more of a formal mentoring relationship. But when we start to talk about, um, you know, some of these informal connections and, you know, it could be somebody that just taught you a new skill or kind of looked out for you in a way when nobody else was, then that really stimulates conversation. Are and you? That, hmm? Yeah. Oh, are you able to do that with, you get pe parents together in, in a group? Yeah. To do that orientation, or I mean, I think you could do it one to one as well, but but also do it one to one. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'll ba I'll back up in just a second and talk a little bit about types of orientation. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, but at any rate, it's a great way to just sort of facilitate some reflection and just tie it back to the fact that you know what we're really asking the mentors to do is to kind of be. Um, an extra hand that we're there, there to really um, not to replace the parent, but to support them, and that you know we're looking for people who listen and you know that kind of thing. So it it helps uh, sometimes to get the parents um, thinking about the fact that this mentor also is is not there necessarily to work miracles, but uh, you know can just be another listening ear and you know kind of work together. Um, in terms of the orientation, um, we actually, through Across Ages, had group orientations um, and where we serve food and it was a time for the families to come and meet the mentors and so forth. One of our major challenges was that getting families out was a huge issue. So we mm -hmm. often did them repeatedly. <laughs> um, and as I talked to other program people, that also seemed to be kind of a recurrent theme that sometimes doing a, an orientation with a large group is challenging, so you have to kind of think about other possible ways of doing it. Um, so those are just some of the, the potential uh, ways of helping parents understand the, the goals. Um, also really asking parents what their expectations are, um, because sometimes there can be a real mismatch between what the parent thinks is going to happen and, uh, you know, what is actually what, what the mentor can really do. The second area is building trust between the mentor and the parent. And uh, I talked to a couple of program people who I thought did some really interesting things around this where they would have um, workshops that involved parents and mentors together where they were really learning um, about activities that um, and, and issues that affected the kids. So in other words, there was a real bonding opportunity between the mentors and the parents because they were learning about stress management or they were learning about bullying in schools or you know, they, were, they were getting some um, information that they could then share and, and really talk about, talk to each other about. Um, 
I know that in uh, in the the work that Renee Spencer did, um, she talked a lot about um, mentors facilitating conversations with with parents. You know, stopping and calling them up, talking a little bit before they went to pick up the child. Um, really. Um, Talking with the with the families about you know what they were going to be doing with the activities and really listening to family members in terms of how they felt about some of the things that were happening. So, trying to give you a, a good example um, in that in Renee's particular study, which I would really encourage you to read, um, parents talked about uh, mentors asking them, for example, uh, I'd like to take your daughter to this movie. You know, is that something that are you comfortable with that? And then honoring it if the if the parent said, I'm not, I'm really not, and, mm -hmm. and the mentor would then say, well, let's think about something else that we could do. And that was really a process, um, but it was a process that uh, also really ended up uh, strengthening the relationship between the child and the the mentor as well. And the, when I talked earlier about the fact that um, when kids think that their family members support the relationship, then they're more invested. So that's, I think, one of the, the reasons that this is such an important piece. Um, yeah, I have a couple, I have a hand raised and a question. Mm -hmm. So okay. I'm going to, Antoinette, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, this is Antoinette Delmonico. I'm actually um, a research assistant working under Renee Spencer. Ah, wonderful. Her, her, took part in that uh, very uh, analysis of those interviews and conducted many interviews myself. So, And I just wanted to add about this very point that you're talking about, that um, building the trust aspect, that um, oftentimes, uh, well, I should say that in some of the interviews that we did, uh, we forgot that we as a collective sort of forget that parents really were the first, they knew their child. Mm -hmm. So they could offer a lot of insight about this is what my kid likes, but he's afraid to say it. This is what, you know, how I, the things that are important to us as a family. So um, uh, being mentors that could really tap into families and parents as a resource to helping them develop that important relationship with their young person. Yeah, when I when I read that, I thought it was so really important to think about getting mentors. How do we get mentors to trust parents and, and what they think? So mm -hmm. we have another hand raised here, too. Um, Brian? Thank you so much, Antoinette. I really appreciate that. I just thought, you know, this was such valuable insight that, you know, particularly because we don't think about asking parents these things. And so I just... You know, I think there's just so much potential in terms of exploring this further. And yes. Brian. Hi, how are you? Um, I just wanted to ask the uh, young woman who was a, a graduate assistant on the uh, the research, were these programs primarily in the uh, Boston area? Was it a Big Brothers Big Sisters program? And did they also um, talk with the programs about whether or not they had done some sort of initial assessment or questionnaire with the parents? Uh, with regard to the parents' understanding of their child's sort of temperament or personality? Um, these were uh, organizations in the uh, large organizations here in Boston, and my understanding, well, these interviews that we conducted were, um, uh, you know, the parent interviews were just about their experience as parents and their relationships and their child's relationships. And so my understanding that I gathered, not from this particular um, research interviews, but post that, uh, is that uh, the programs, the few programs we've been working with do ask parents about, you know, what they want, what they're hoping for, what they're looking for, um, and that type of, uh, those types of related questions. Um, but um, interesting, if that you mentioned, I'm, my actual dissertation is looking at parent roles in mentoring relationships, and so I've finished conducting a round of interviews with agencies, parents, um, and mentors alike, asking them specifically about parent roles, and I think one That's of the great. things that this mentions, um, this review is sort of talking about, are is everyone on the same page 
about the expectations, not only for the mentor's role, what are the program's goals, but what is the expectation for parents' roles? Um, based, you know, a program may have its expectations, a mentor may have their expectations, mm -hmm. and parents have theirs. So if not everyone's on the same page about everyone's roles, it can get a little tricky. And, you know, some, uh, if you have strong mentors who are really good at facilitating and sort of, you know, walking through that, or parents who are really mm -hmm. strong at voicing, okay, no, this isn't going the way I wanted to, or this is what I'm expecting. It can be That's tricky. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. What was your name again? Antoinette Delmonica. Antoinette. Thank you so much. I look forward yep. to reading your dissertation. Hopefully sooner than later. <laughs> All right. oh, so will I, Thank actually. You. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Thank you. That's That's so really much. Important. That was really interesting. Yeah, I think that also, you know, this gets back to also the Keller's theory about the, you know, systemic mentoring work is that um, I think that when there is a disconnect between and, and lack of communication between all the involved parties, you know, when something gets slightly off kilter, that's also, I think, potentially can be potentially very challenging. And I, I think that this is an area that we really haven't explored very much. So I'm thrilled that Antoinette is doing her dissertation on this. And I think there's lots of opportunity for, uh, you know, for this in the future. Um, the third practice is really enhancing the skills and confidence of the mentor. And I think this is both um, training for mentors around, you know, what's their role and what are the parameters of the program and so forth. But I think it really is a confidence issue also. It's like how do you approach parents? How, what kinds of problem solving skills might I need? What kinds of communication skills? You know, what do I do if I, um, if the, the parent seems to, um, you know, be dismissive or, you know, I'm not able to get through or, and, if, and I think the, the same is true for parents. A lot of times they don't feel that the mentor may be approaching them in a way that, and, and the mentor may not be appreciating what they're really hearing. And so I think sometimes mentors come into this um, relationship with this notion that they're going to be saving the child, and uh, that's really not what they're there for. Um, you know, certainly there are those mentoring relationships where parents are not able to kind of fulfill their parental obligations in the way that many of us think they should, um, and that may be, uh, you know, a, a way, an area in which the mentor takes on a different role and kind of, you know, does more of the parenting stuff, but the truth is that they are there to be supportive of the child and I think to also to support a healthy parent-child relationship because that is the first connection. I have a, a comment to share from Rita. Uh, she says, we have found it is significant to ask the child, guardian, and mentor before and again at the match visit in one another's presence, why are they involved and what are their expectations and how will they support the match? Mm -hmm. I think that's excellent. and. I also would add that I think that those are questions that could be asked throughout because I think also sometimes, you know, we get into this and expectations aren't met or things change or, um, you know, you kind of go through this honeymoon period with the mentor and youth and then all of a sudden things aren't moving along quite well and so that's the importance of the monitoring and I think the kind of continually checking in. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think the challenge overall, I'm kind of jumping into challenges, but I, I think one of the things is that when we, we look at this level of, um, of support, I think, that everybody needs, it also then becomes a question of staff resources. It's like, how am I going to do this, you know, kind of given everything else that I need to do. And so I think we need to also think about how we can get some of this, um, some of this work done uh, without putting undue burden on staff. But again, it gets back to that whole kind of vigilance that's necessary in mentoring programs. This is not like, you know, we'll just match you up and we'll see you in six months and see how it goes, which I know all of you know, but uh, when I do training for, for communities sometimes, they have no idea how, how um, challenging it can be to really start an effective mentoring program. Um, there's a, uh, that, that said, there's, here's a question, another question about the um, orientation mm -hmm. and that so when about with parents and guardians and probably intrigued about the idea of doing an orientation for them but so when parents and guardians are invited to orientation it's sort of several questions but are invited to orientation are our mentors present 
Are mm -hmm. the children present? Mm -hmm. And then if a guardian, parent or guardian, does not attend the orientation, can they still get a mentor for the child? You know, thinking about that mm -hmm. burden on the on those, you know, staff or kind of, is there a, you know, joint yeah. mentor guardian or separate orientation? Yeah, kind of what happens if they if the parents don't attend, which could get into that question of protecting that child. If the parent's not going to be on board, then does that yeah. put the relationship at risk? Well, I can only speak from my own experience because this is—I didn't see anything in the literature that really talked about this um, particularly. Uh, and again, I'm going to—I am going to get into some of the challenges about what's out there. But um, I know what what I've always done is we did have an orientation that involved parents and mentors together. Um, the kids did come, uh, you know, very often because we would do this after work, and it was not possible for families to come without children. Uh, we tried to offer child care if there are like little kids there and things of that sort. Because it, it, in addition to orienting parents about the program, it was also a time for the mentors and parents to meet. Um, we actually would pursue parents, you know, because we wanted the kids to be in the program. We wanted them to have a match. And so we often went to great lengths to try to you know, get in touch with parents. Um, and so what I think one of the things that we found was that when we had to pursue a parent to that extent to get them to orient, to orient them to the program, that we were in fact pursuing them for months to come. Mm -hmm. But that's what we did. So There's a couple other um, comments here. Mm -hmm. uh, so a great um, suggestion from Hannah uh, that says that they have recently revised their mentee application to include questions directed to the parents regarding their five program goals. Um, they now specifically ask the parents to provide suggestions about how the mentor can help to improve the child's self-esteem, how the mentor can learn to, or how the mentor can help the child learn to help others, learn to respect others, make good decisions and expand their horizons by trying new things, which is an interesting way of sort of getting a sense of where the parent's expectations are. I think that's mm -hmm. a great idea to share. Um, mm -hmm. And then, which, Hannah, you could share that at the Great Ideas Exchange at our conference. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then just a question from Kathy with Helping Services in Iowa, but what, um, what innovative strategies, and this is kind of to the group, but what and so maybe we can throw it out there and, and I'll share after we finish this slide and whatnot about any responses. But Kathy's asking, what innovative strategies are programs doing to enhance mentors' skills and confidence, um, which actually might be another webinar topic someday. Mm -hmm. All right. Actually, I think it would be great because mm -hmm. I, I think, again, you know, I'm bringing these things up kind of based on my reading and some of my conversations with people in the field, but, you know, clearly... I was limited in terms of um, my reach, and so I would love to have more discussion about this, and any practices that people could share I think would be really terrific. So thank you. Great. Um, I just want to briefly mention the, the last one, which is about connecting families to resources. And, you know, again, I think this is very, it's one of these things that's necessary but tricky because, um, you know, clearly there are many families, certainly that I have worked with over the years, who really needed access to um, skill building and support and educational resources and social services and things like that. And, you know, I think that we're limited in terms of our capacity to connect them. So I think if you have a, a grant that allows you to do that, I think that's terrific. I think anything that we can do to um, connect families to what's out there in the community is also very helpful. I don't think that we as staff people can function as case managers. Um, but if we had case managers on staff who could actually do this, then I think that's another way of really supporting the family. I've heard more and more, you know, just anecdotally programs that, you know, have seen that as important to have sort of this full circle approach. Yeah. I think, again, what a lot of this sort of suggests is that we may need to think a little bit more strategically about how can we, you know, if we need to do more mentor training, for example, and if we need to do more to build the confidence of the mentor, what does that look like and who's going to do it and how is it going to get done? 
you know, I think the same thing is true with connecting families to resources. Okay, any other comments or questions? Okay. So these are just some of the things that um, I've kind of identified that we still don't really totally understand. So one of the challenges that I had in looking at a lot of the existing research was that there really wasn't any way to kind of disentangle the findings. You know, so there was um, um, the way parents were involved and the outcomes for the kids. So there wasn't any clear connection. It wasn't point A to point B. Um, and I think, you know, that, so I think that's one of the areas in which further study and research could be very helpful. And kind of going along with that then, so what then constitutes the right amount and the right kind of involvement? You know, how do we um, make sure that we get parents involved, that we listen to what they have to say, that we, you know, are able to help that kind of guide the relationship. And then also, what do we do around those issues around the boundary piece, which I talked about before? Um, you know, how does a mentor handle it if they feel they're getting sucked into the family's business? You know, how, how do they um, kind of set some boundaries around that? Um, we've uh, had situations where family members kind of sometimes abdicated responsibility and suddenly the mentor kind of found themselves in a position where they were almost felt like they were responsible for the total well-being of the child. You know, hopefully that's not a common occurrence, but again, I think we need to figure out how to, how to deal with that. And then I think the last thing is that there's looking at parent involvement for different populations of, of youth. So, I know that uh, Mentor, for example, has done a toolkit on uh, mentoring refugee and immigrant youth. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, there are, I think, issues that are around involving families that could be um, very challenging. You know, if you've got families who are limited English speaking who um, are not familiar with the culture. Um, so I think that presents a whole other area. Um, certainly, um, youth who have parents who are incarcerated have their own special issues. Again, there is some work out there. There are some strategies and tools, but not a lot still. And then I think for young people from particularly challenged family circumstances, um, I think we still need to, uh, there's still more work that needs to be done around how do we, you know, connect mentors to those families. Again, what do we do around boundary issues and so forth. So um, we, have a, we have a hand raised. Can I? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Antoinette? See. Antoinette, I have you unmuted if you wanted to share or maybe try. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I just wanted to add that I think, you know, this disentangling this, the findings really that we also have to consider and think about that if relationships between an adult, a, a mentor and their youth can change and grow and develop over a period of time, then we might also think about how the parents' involvement might be different at different times mm -hmm. and might, based on where the relationship's going, could look one way in the first three months, could look very different six months later, and could look something even, or go back. So not so much a static involvement. It looks one way throughout the whole relationship, but that it too can possibly yeah. go up and down or change or ebb and flow. Yeah, I think it's fluid and it's also perhaps along a continuum you know, where there's kind of back and forth along that that continuum. So that's a good way to phrase it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any okay. other comments on the, on the what's missing piece? <laughs> we can pause here and see if anybody. I'm going to move forward and okay. just move forward with the slide. And then as people type or raise their hand, I'll get them in here. Oops. Here we go. So that's kind of where we're at here. But. That's kind of where we are. So um, I'm really interested in any um, good. We have some some resources here. I'll put you know these are just some resources from like for the mentoring partnership and just to, a reminder that this presentation is available on slideshare.net slash training institute. Um, we, we will send that follow up email, but here's some specifically these resources on preparing parents and and parent and caregiver involvement. So, and, and I think, Andrea, you wanted to speak to some of these as well. 
Um, yeah, I just, uh, th this was another thing that I was sort of interested in, as I said, when I was looking at potential resources, is that, again, there's a tremendous amount out there about parent involvement in uh, both in school and out of school time, and very little on parent involvement in, in mentoring programs. And they do talk a lot about, or what's out there, I think, refers to the fact that you know, it's important for parents to be involved. We just still don't know exactly what that looks like. So mm -hmm. I think that's one of the challenges. But I think all three of these resources are really, um, are really excellent. Um, and I think that, again, it's, it really is providing parents a way to kind of navigate. Because I think that the whole notion of having your child in a mentoring relationship is really unknown for everybody. Uh, and so, and there, of course, there are no roadmaps in life, but I think the more kind of guidance we can provide, um, the, the better off we're going to be in the end. Um, so I'm just kind of curious as to any comments that uh, folks had, anything that kind of jumps out at you, whether this is, um, um, whether this resonates with your own experience. Mm -hmm. And I just put this up so people could see it, but I, you know, I have a question flashing at me, but I'm not seeing the question. Here we go, here. Oh, you know what? I've got questions here in the chat section. So, um, Andrew, did, did you find any research on engaging with youth who are gang, engaging parents with youth who are gang involved, or parents of youth who are gang involved? I did not. The most that I found was, uh, as I mentioned, the, the studies that involved um, children who were exhibiting excessive, excessively aggressive behavior. Okay. That to be pretty much it. I would say that overall, the challenge in doing this it was the dearth of relationships, uh, the, the dearth of research, rather, on parent involvement. There really wasn't much out there. So anybody who's looking for future research or dissertation work, <laughs> I think there's lots of opportunity here. Which hopefully Antoinette, when in a future webinar, will have you um, presenting your research for quality in action. Uh, we do have another question here. Uh, oh, where can we find the, oh, for Ashley, um, the resources that we had on the previous slide, they're all linked there. And so when you look at the, uh, if you look at the slides on SlideShare, you can just click and it'll take you right to that fact sheet from the um, U.S. Department of Education. And thanks to uh, our AmeriCorps member, Courtney, for, and for Alicia for finding those three and putting that together. Yes, thank you. And as you said, that? we will be sending you the, the references in connection with this so that you can have that, uh, you know, for your own review. Right. Uh, and there's some enthusiastic support for Antoinette doing a future webinar. Which, speaking of future webinars, our next Quality in Action webinar is starts the first Wednesday of the month. Um, next month we are want to talk about waiting for Superman and not so much sort of do you agree with what's presented and or not, but what's the what is mentoring's response? And um, just to throw it out here to this group while you're still on here, um, if you have examples of your program and how you're using this film um, to help, you know, get more mentors, uh, you know, inspire people to mentor or, you know, just examples of your quality ideas in action. We'd love to feature those uh, in that webinar. So you can just get in touch with us and share those ideas. I know there's lots of good ones out there. Um, also want to, if you haven't seen Waiting for, or haven't heard of it, or don't know anything about Waiting for Superman, um, you know, download this, or look at this, uh, these slides and, and click on the links and check it out. Um, and just to mention too, it's not too late to register for the Minnesota Mentoring Conference on Monday, October 25th with Andrea Taylor as our keynote presenter. The theme of the conference is also quality in action. Uh, and we've got... Um, I think we're close to our, our 200 mark, but still room for uh, more participants as well. Um, do we have another question here? Let's see. I don't. I thought I saw another question flash at me, but I don't see that. Oh, Polly. Polly, I'm going to unmute you here one second. Okay. 
And Polly, did you have your hand raised or a question? I feel like I, Polly's in our office. I feel like I can hear her talking, but maybe she's muted herself on her headset or something, but we can't hear Polly. Well, anyway, uh, for everyone, it is 12 or 1 o'clock. Um, thank you so much for participating. Again, you'll get some follow-up information. We hope to see you next month. Um, any further um, questions or comments, suggestions for Andrea, um, happy to pass those along. Uh, pass those along to her or take the opportunity at the conference to speak with her uh, directly. Um, thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. And I just want to um, say I'm so glad that Antoinette was on the call. Uh, I think it was extremely helpful to uh, hear it right from somebody who was involved with the research. So thank you so much. Oh, and Polly wanted to help promote tomorrow's webinar. Uh, it's uh, Promising Practices in youth mentoring and um, with Dr. Karcher and um, David and Mike Nuckala, uh moderated by, or no, maybe David's not doing it, it's just Michael, just Car Michael Karcher and Mike Nuckala um, talking about um, that new journal, Promising Practices. I should have had a slide in here about that, but if you haven't heard of it, you can Google Promising Practices in Youth Mentoring and it'll, it'll get you there. It's a uh, 11 o'clock, um, at 11 o'clock central time tomorrow so um, we'll hope to see if you can participate in that as well for another um, another dose of, of research and quality in action all right thanks everybody I'm gonna um, end the webinar thanks again bye bye, bye, -bye.